Them dreams so big that they'll haunt you or they'll calm you. That's how you know if you got it, go and get it, get to win and not conquer. I had to go out and get it without a sponsor. Kept it real, never crooked, yeah, that's honor. Now I can go out and get it how I want to. Hashtag bless. What is up, YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter? Welcome back to The Ryan Maddow Show. Thank you for joining us. Today is Thursday, April 18th. It's 10.01 a.m., and we are going to have an awesome show. I'm going to be interviewing a gentleman by the name of Joe Burnett, and he produced uh, what is called Your Wealth is Melting. It's a report over, I believe it's part of Unchained. I'm going to have him explain it to us. But, man, this thing absolutely blew my mind. I don't want to over-talk it. I want to let Joe come on and introduce himself. Joe, welcome to the show. How are you, buddy? Awesome, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Man, it's a, it's an honor to have you on the show. I was just talking to you right before the show. This this report absolutely blew my blew my mind, and I really want to get into all the details of it. But I want to hear a little bit about yourself first. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and we'll kind of dive into it. Yeah, absolutely. So I can kind of start with my Bitcoin origin story. I feel like that's kind of interesting for for a lot of people. Uh, I learned about Bitcoin in college back in 2017. And I'd always been, you know, grew up interested in finance and investing. And in 2017 was, you know, people remember it was a pretty major Bitcoin bull run when Bitcoin went from start of the year around thousand dollars and then rose to, to 20,000. And I'd always been interested in finance and investing. So I grew up thinking like, oh, the way that you save for the future is by buying Coca-Cola, holding it for 30 years. It goes up 2% per year. And then you earn a you know three percent dividend, and that's how you save for the future. And then I saw this Bitcoin thing. I heard about it just scrolling on Reddit, I think, and and it was on 2017. And I noticed it went from a thousand dollars to three thousand dollars to six thousand, and then up to twenty thousand dollars. And it obviously captivated me because I was like, well, why am I holding this you know Coca Cola when I could be holding this Bitcoin thing that's like absolutely just skyrocketing? And I had no idea really why. So it really captivated me right from the start. And then that bear market following that, I really just dove deep into Bitcoin and figured out, you know, why it, it is simply the best form of money humanity has ever discovered and just kind of was hooked and couldn't stop thinking about it ever since. After college, I started my career in technology consulting at Ernst & Young. After that, I joined a Bitcoin mining company in 2021. And, and then now I'm a part of Unchained where I joined last year, where we help individuals and companies securely hold Bitcoin without a single point of failure. Man, that's such a cool story. I remember a lot of people did the opposite. You know, they rode that bear market up and they got wrecked and then they just completely turned their heads. And I always say that that was one of my uh, my biggest regrets. I took my money that I made in the 2017 bull run and started a business. And that business was going to, you know, mine me more fiat to buy more Bitcoin. And then so I left the crypto space kind of and I wish I would have stayed in it. I think a lot of people you know, go through those bear markets and then they completely turn their head. I think we saw a lot of that in the 2021, 2022 bear market where a lot of people got in in 2021, they got wrecked and they kind of gave them a sour taste and they left the market when really in those bear markets, you doubled down and you started studying it and you, you fell in love with the technology. That's, I think that's rare. I don't think many people do that. So what, what drove you to keep, keep digging into it? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I was like pre- supposed or, or i had the like background to really understand or be interested in bitcoin a lot more than most people so when i was in college i i based i studied information systems and computer science and originally i was thinking about studying finance and so the background of finance plus computers and computer science kind of set me up well to like being naturally interested in something like bitcoin and then i also came from you know conservative slash libertarian background and mindset of I want smaller government and I want free markets to progress and I want individuals to have freedom, liberty and, and take on responsibility and act on their own self-interest. And I think like those three things make Bitcoin extremely, you know, it's something that you want to be true from the beginning, from, from the start. And so it makes you like dive into it more. It makes you consider, you know, something as groundbreaking as a new revolutionary money, like something that most normal people would be like, that's insane. Like that's crazy. 
it, inc it, it forces you or it encourages you to like actually dive in and, and really try to figure out if this could possibly work. And then, like I said, during the bear market, I did dive into it because I think I, I wanted it to be true to some extent. And then I figured out, you know, as it fell from 20,000 to back to 3000, I was trying to figure out ways that it, it couldn't work. And, you know, I'd read Bloomberg, I'd watch CNBC and I would hear the guests go on and talk about Bitcoin. And during the bear market, especially many were you know, very against Bitcoin and their, their logic and reasoning behind it just like didn't really make sense to me. It was like, okay, you've maybe spent a day researching Bitcoin, but you clearly don't understand it. And it kind of made me like more, more bullish and excited about it because I was like the, the people that manage trillions of dollars in the world today don't fully understand Bitcoin or don't even really understand it at all, then I'm, it's possible that I might be right here. So then that's what kind of led me to, to really diving deep that bear market. Wow, that's a badass story, man. I think you're right on the the way that the the media tries to manipulate your perspective of reality almost, and they're really good at it. And it's it's pretty cool that we're we're living through a time where I think a, a most people are waking up and they're realizing that. So like the media's ability to manipulate a story or to push a narrative, I mean, it's getting they get torn apart in real time, especially with Twitter now. I mean, it's the people on Twitter the second that a, a fake news story breaks, you see it, and now you see it with like Peter Schiff and what Natalie did last week, and uh, you know. The community's waking up and they're realizing that Bitcoin is that. So how did you how did you come to on chain? You left the mining company. And was that did you leave the mining company to go start Unchained? Are you a founder of Unchained or is this somebody where you just partnered up with? No, yeah. So I'm on the marketing team at Unchained. Uh we have currently about a little over a hundred employees at this point. And yeah, I left a company called Blockware Solutions in 2021. I wanted to join Unchained because I think there are very few things in the world more important than one, getting people to buy Bitcoin, but two, getting people to hold it in a secure, responsible way where they're not necessarily trusting external third parties, whether that's Coinbase, BlackRock, FTX. It's better when individuals out in the world are in control of the keys to their Bitcoin and they hold the Bitcoin. And so that's what Unchained does is we help people hold Bitcoin without a single point of failure. So you're not relying on the government or any single institution to make sure that you still have access to your Bitcoin. Unchained is there as a backup in case you happen to lose one of the keys to your Bitcoin, but you, are, you remain in total control of your Bitcoin with an Unchained vault. And so, yeah, I joined Unchained, you know, eight months ago or so, and it's been a, been a great opportunity. I'm not a founder though. <laughs> Okay, man, I don't think people watching this really realize like, like can comprehend what you're saying. And so I was in, in 2015, I was mining Ethereum when it was $2 and 64 cents. Uh, back then was like the, the wild, wild west of crypto. But you know, in 2015, there wasn't, there wasn't videos about like, I mean, there was a few of not your keys, not your crypto, but it wasn't like driven into your skull. And I had been on Polonex since like 2014. And all the way until 2017, 18, all the way through the bull run, never had any issues. And I left all my crypto, not all my crypto on Polonex, but I had kind of some on Binance, some on Polonex, some on Cryptopia, but a lot on Cryptopia and a lot on Polonex. And then in 2019, at the when the Fed raised interest rates to like 3.5% and the markets just collapsed and Cardano, I think went down to like a penny and a half. Bitcoin was like sub 3000 or right around 3000. And it was the absolute, like the, the week of the absolute bottom of the bear market, Polonex sold and converted all my crypto to USDC into a stable coin. And I didn't know it. They had sent me an email, right? So I just assumed that, I, like I said, I had stepped away from crypto and I wasn't really paying attention. I just assumed all my crypto would always been there. It would always be there. And I got on and like the, not the peak of the 2020 bull run, but pretty, pretty far into it to realize that I had a couple, like 10,000 or $15,000 in USDC. They had sold all my crypto at the bottom of the bear market. And mm -hmm. then found out Cryptopia, my another big giant bags of crypto were on Cryptopia and their government took over that exchange. So I was even trying to like thinking like, you know, a little bit of spreading my wealth out to multiple centralized exchanges. So I didn't have a single point of failure, but multiple of them, two out of three failed and I lost millions. So um, not just, you know, just storing your crypto that you own or your, your keys, but get, getting it off those exchanges is so important because with one executive order or the swoop of a pen or one government, tyrannical government decides that they want your crypto. I mean, they can take that, they take that exchange over. And I don't think people really realize that. So how does, how does, 
how does Unchained work with that? Like if I came to you and I was like, hey, you know, is it is it something you got you recommend for people that have a couple thousand or is this something for kind of for bigger players? Yeah, first, I guess you, you made some great points. Like I think Bitcoin is so unique. It's one of the few assets that you can it's, it's a bearer asset, which means you can actually hold it with no counterparty risk. If you think about, you know, pretty much every other asset that you have in the world today, whether it's U.S. Treasuries, S&P 500, any sort of company stock that you have in your brokerage account, even real estate, all of those assets are kind of dependent on the government or specific entities or a specific company that can restrict your access and, you know, do something with your asset. Bitcoin is literally a bare asset that you can hold as long as you have access to the private key. It's kind of like it's like gold, but it's, you know, data that 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 is protecting your Bitcoin. And so Unchained, what we do is we have a personal vault. We have many products, but our main product is our vault product where it's something called a two of three Bitcoin multisig, which simply means you have three keys protecting your Bitcoin and two keys are required to move your Bitcoin out of your vault. And so what this happens, what happens is you as an unchained client, you have two keys that gives you complete control control over your Bitcoin. And then Unch Unchained holds one key as a backup. And Unchained currently helps secure, I think, five billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And it's for it's really for anybody. If you have a I would say if you have a significant portion of your net worth in Bitcoin, or you have a significant amount of money in Bitcoin and significant can be, you know, $5,000. It could be $500 million. It could be $5 billion. Um, whatever is significant to you, you want to make sure you're protecting your Bitcoin without, you know, without with, with, as best as possible. You don't want to, you don't want to risk making a mistake, losing one of your private keys or trusting a third party or an exchange to, to make sure that they trust, they hold your Bitcoin correctly. You want to make sure your Bitcoin is secure for, for generations, right? And Unchained helps you do that, whether again, you are a small fish or one Michael Saylor himself. <laughs> and that's so cool. And it, and it really is. It's, you guys are offering such a great service. And the fact that you, that you still have control of your Bitcoin, that Unchained is just an extra point. So you, you, you keep two of your your cards or two of your keys yourself, which you can fully un unlock your Bitcoin with. Do you do you suggest um, that somebody finds like an attorney to hold one, and then you get a will wrote out, and then that way, if something if you die, the attorney can come to Unchained and pass that to your kid. Is that an option? Yeah, absolutely. There's an inheritance product that basically is exactly that, to where if you happen to pass away and you wanted to easily pass your your Bitcoin, your bare asset onto your heirs, Unchain has a product that makes it really easy to do that, where you, you end up giving your one of your keys to an attorney or, or, or whatnot, or another family member. And it makes the process of recovery when you're gone and, and you happen to take one of your keys with you or or you didn't share it or you know, no one knows where it is. People can use the Unchained inheritance protocol, call up Unchained and easily move the, the Bitcoin that you know your heirs inherited into the the vault that they control so yeah you can definitely do stuff like that which is, makes it really cool because <sighs> if you had it all on you know one cold card or one treasure and you had you were the only person that had access to that private key if you happened to pass away or, or or anything bad happened and no one in your family knew where that private key was or even didn't really even know what to do with it if they found it then it your potentially your your bitcoin is potentially gone forever so Unchained makes that super easy for, for your children or, or whoever you're trying to pass your Bitcoin on to. Yeah, I'm thinking even worse is like a, a relative that comes over to help clean out your house, whatever one finds it first and puts it in their pocket and <laughs> walks away with yeah. your with your stash of Bitcoin and the right relative might not uh, not get the inheritance they're supposed to get. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. let's uh, let's let's pivot a little bit. Let's jump into this. Um, your wealth is melting. Uh, they can go download this. I believe this is over on your X, correct? Yes, it's it's some of my tweets that I've done, and it's also at unchained.com slash melting. Cool. Let me pull that up. So walk us through. Give us a like a high level overview of what we're going to dive into. And I kind of want to you know go through this piece by piece. You have a piece on on data storage. You have the acceleration in production. I want to talk a little bit about 
um, the total global energy production I want to dive into. I want to dive into data transmissions and speeds, and I want to dive into oil production. And then I believe the last one was, I think we start diving into cost of lumber. Yeah, lumber production, and then all, all these good things. So give us a high-level overview of what this is really quick. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I was writing this, I think a large majority of people in the world today view Bitcoin as like a speculative bet. Like they think it's a lottery ticket. It's this risky, high tech, you know, new startup type thing that, you know, could be worth millions one day, but it could also be worth zero. And I don't think that that's really the correct way to look at it. I think there's a pretty high probability Bitcoin will be worth millions and experience lottery ticket like returns. But I think there's a better way to think about Bitcoin. And I think the way to, to look at it is look at Bitcoin is just money, right? Like right now we all use the dollar. Most people in the world use the dollar. It's basically the world reserve currency and people measure their assets and their wealth in dollars. And when you do that, you know, the S&P 500 keeps going up. Uh, the Your house that you bought for half a million dollars is now worth, you know, $700,000 that keeps going up. Um, but maybe part of the reason why these assets are going up is because the government is running tri multi-trillion dollar annual deficits. The Federal Reserve is monetizing those deficits and they're effectively debasing the dollar. And they're doing this, you know, on, on purpose. And, and it's, you know, well known, like the dollar is designed to debase against these very, you know, basic consumer goods that like lumber, like food, uh, that I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, but the dollar is designed to debase against these, these basic consumer goods that we're getting more and more capable, more and more productive at, at actually producing them. And so when you're measuring your wealth in this, you know, unit of account that is designed to debase, that may not be the most appropriate way to measure your wealth. And so when you start measuring your wealth in Bitcoin, you'll very quickly see that, hey, your house is not actually going up in value. Like when you account for, you know, it's basically just a bunch of lumber and, and stuff put together. And over time in Bitcoin terms, especially during the monetization of Bitcoin, which I think is what's been happening over the last 15 years and will probably keep happening over the next 15 years is your house is melting or, or, or dropping significantly in Bitcoin terms. And it's not just your house, it's the S&P 500. It's dollars themselves, it's bonds, it's gold. All of these assets are following in Bitcoin terms. And I think that's a better way to think about Bitcoin is if it's the better money, you should be measuring your wealth in Bitcoin, not thinking about it as, oh, I hope Bitcoin goes to a million dollars. You should be looking at your house and saying, oh, wow, my house was worth 50 Bitcoin a few years ago. And now it's only worth seven Bitcoin. Like that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. Maybe I should have just held Bitcoin instead of buying, you know, 10 houses or hundred houses or whatever you might've done. And so that's kind of the framework that I had when, when writing the report is I wanted people to shift their, their mindset and thinking about, and think about Bitcoin as money itself, rather than the speculative lottery ticket that they hope goes up over time. That's pretty deep, man. That's really deep, and I and I like it. I like the I like the sound of it. I like I like I, I agree with it 100 percent because I think Eric. I don't know if you've interviewed or had a chance to speak with Eric V Stacks yet, but he's he's an amazing Bitcoiner and his logic on things. He goes, everybody thinks that BlackRock is out has this you know this huge scheme to buy up all the single family homes in America and make you you know a slave. And Eric's like, well, it may, you know maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. He goes, or maybe BlackRock's just serving their, serving their self interest. Right, their their job is to to take wealth from people and use that wealth to generate returns and make their clients money. If they didn't make their clients money, they wouldn't be in business today. And he goes, so mm -hmm. where where is the best spot to park your capital? Where what what inflates the most with with time, you know, and it, and with the with the money printer and it's real estate. So maybe they're just parking their capital in real estate because it it had the best returns. And then you see what they've done with Bitcoin in the last you know couple of months. They bought basically fifteen billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And you look at that and you go, wow, that's uh, that's 15 billion that probably would have went into single family homes. So then it yeah. kind of helped, you know, people storing their wealth in Bitcoin versus looking to store it in things that really shouldn't be investment vehicles. Uh, you know, a home should be something that you raise a family in and not something that you make as a long-term investment because you can't save in the currency of your country. Yep, 
Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think you make a great point. And I've talked about this on, on Twitter or X before, but I think it's very ironic and unfortunate that a lot of people today, you know, they, they hate, they don't hate, or they don't like big government. They don't like big corporations and they don't like that, you know, living conditions in real estate have just, you know, rents gone up so much or, or, or your mortgage payment, if you buy a new house has gone up so much. And the reason it's it's going so up up so much is because people are storing their wealth in government bonds, which is helping fund you know big government. They're storing their wealth in the S and P five hundred, which is helping fund you know big corrupt corporations. And it's also going into real estate, and it's helping you know pump up the prices of real estate. And then if you look at basically what's in your four hundred one k, which is that traditional diversified portfolio, it's a lot of the Americans are storing their wealth. And they're crowding their their own self and out of the housing market. They're also funding all of these corrupt companies. They're also funding big government itself. And so Bitcoin is is a great solution because now we're no longer we don't have to fund you know big government. We don't have to fund big you know woke corporations. We don't have to keep you know pumping up the price of real estate just to store wealth in the future. Now we can hold Bitcoin, which will probably continue outperforming all of those massive big entities and big industries and the world will be a better place because maybe now we can empower more local entrepreneurs rather than you know the apples and the facebooks and and, and you know whoever else in the, in, in the world and so i think it's going to be a big great shift for humanity because again like people are americans are the ones that are ironically funding a lot of the the big corrupt institutions and bitcoin is a way to opt out of that and, and outperform them as well Man, that's deep, bro. I, I never, I guess, I never really thought about it like that. That's so good. We are, we're, we're funding our own demise because we don't have a choice. Because if you don't park your capital into some type of investment vehicle, you end up in poverty. So it's like you're forced to, you're forced, you're forced to play in a system that's literally designed for you to lose. Like I, mm -hmm. I made a post just before we went live. I said we, it's crazy. We live in a in a world where we have regulators that are protecting us from the people that are stealing our money, and. It's it's so freaking mind blowing and Bitcoin completely levels that playing field for once you have an opportunity to to take your wealth out of that system. What do you think it is that prevents so many people from having that arrogant, ignorant mindset of Bitcoin's going to zero, the Internet's going to get turned off? It's like they think of every excuse in the book. Are these people that you've I get a lot of in my live chat a lot, uh, especially over on LFA TV and uh, are those just the people that are so broke they can't afford it? So misery loves company, so they're just going to try to dog on it, dunk on it because they've made such horrible decisions with their life they can't afford to buy any? Or are these people that honestly are just mentally ill? What What is that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think over time, you know, kind of goes without saying, but it, it's still worth reiterate, reiterating that over time, more and more people are adopting Bitcoin. I would say global adoption is still like, less than 1% of like real people that truly understand Bitcoin and are like using it as a unit of account and measuring their wealth in it, measuring their opportunity costs in Bitcoin. Uh, but I think global adoption is still growing. The people that haven't adopted Bitcoin yet, I think they're coming, right? Like every cycle where Bitcoin goes up and, you know, like 2017, it went from 1,000 to 20,000 and 2020 and 2021, it went from, you know, 20,000 to 69,000. This cycle, you know, we may go significantly higher than where we are today. And I think whenever you get that number go up in GU technology, that brings in another cycle. It's kind of like a reflexive feedback loop where more people take a step back and they realize, wait, Bitcoin's not dead. You know, largest companies in the world just launched Bitcoin ETFs. They're selling it, you know, in billions worth, billions of dollars worth of it to, you know, retail investors to accredited investors to hedge funds to to buy and hold bitcoin so maybe something's there and i think every cycle more and more people get more into bitcoin or, or start to question their original assumptions but i think like what holds a lot of people back is kind of like the idea that it's not necessarily that bitcoin is like an iq test or or something like that <laughs> it's more about like bitcoin is a test to to, to see if you're able to think for yourself and it, and because right now, like, again, if you turn on CNBC or Bloomberg or over the last 15 years, you've done that, you know, or, or listen to your, you know, your finance professor talk about Bitcoin or, or whatnot, they're all like adamantly against it because it was something that they haven't really seen before. 
and you know we've never really seen the monetization of a new form of money and so it's it's very reasonable for if you've been stuck in the existing system and you've made money off the existing system it would make sense that you in intuitively like don't understand bitcoin and you have this bias to not under understanding bitcoin but i think over time these people will eventually start to to you know accept Bitcoin or, or learn about Bitcoin, I think number go up technology is kind of what, what's going to eventually enable them to, you know, kind of throw in the towel, throw in their ego and maybe admit that, hey, you know, Bitcoin hasn't died, even though I've said it was going to die, you know, for the last 10 years, uh, eventually they're going to wake up and realize that, hey, this is just better money and I probably should start holding at least some. You know, it's, it's weird. I'm more excited for Bitcoin's price to go up for all the people who haven't bought in yet to buy in. It's so weird. Bitcoin could crash down to 20,000 and I probably couldn't convince 10 people to buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin goes to 150,000. I'll have my grandma's best friends texting me, asking me how to buy Bitcoin. It, it blows my mind. Yep. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's so funny how, again, like everyone reaches out right when Bitcoin is like going up and they're like, wait, is now, now a good time to buy Bitcoin? And I'm like, I've been talking about this for like the last seven years or whatnot. Maybe you should have bought it when no one wanted to buy it. But yeah, no, I think... I think it's it's still good for people to buy Bitcoin when it's just absolutely going through the roof because you do actually have that that renewed sense of of you have an extreme sense of confidence even though in the short term it may not be the best the best idea but in the long term you know even if you bought twenty thousand dollars back in in 2017 you still did pretty well compared to buying the S and P 500 or, or oh, yeah. any other traditional asset so if you have a long enough time horizon, I don't think that there's necessarily like a bad time to buy Bitcoin. I couldn't agree more. So walk me through this first part. Uh, you get into data storage. It says the history of data storage offers another stack illustration of production acceleration. Can you dive into that a little bit and explain a little bit to our, to our audience what, what you're talking about here? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of these early sections and the it's titled like the acceleration of production a lot of these early sections are kind of just to show people that humanity is getting more productive. For example, data storage, right? Like if you wanted to store one gigabyte worth of data back in, you know, early times, it would have taken like 1 million days to actually record one gigabyte of data. But today you can do, you can store one gigabyte worth of data in, you know, less than a second on a, you know, modern hard drive that you can just go buy from Best Buy for like 200 bucks. And you're talking so, about back in the day, they would engrave, like they would have to get out a stone and hand engrave all of the information that they wanted to store. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. So like if you, you know, one, 1000 BC or, or, or whatnot, if you wanted to store any sort of data, you would have to get like a clay tablet or, or something and write that data out physically with like a scribe. But yeah, now we can literally store what took 1 million days. We can store that in a second on a modern hard drive. And the only point of, of kind of highlighting a lot of these sections is to illustrate that we are becoming more productive at producing the con typical consumer goods, right? Whether that's data storage, whether that's farming, whether that's lumber, and the dollar, all the dollar is, is it's a basket of these consumer goods, right? And so you'll see like the statistics over time that, you know, $1 doesn't go as far as it used to. Like gas used to be a 20 cents or whatnot. And now gas is $3 a gallon or, or higher. And so the dollar is being debased against this basket of consumer goods. And at the very same time, humanity over the last 200 plus years has become absurdly productive at producing these goods. So it's kind of like a, a double bad miss for the world where not only is your dollar losing value against these basic goods like food and lumber and, and data storage or, or whatnot, but we're actually getting better at producing food, lumber and, and a bunch of other goods. And so it's kind of just a, a really unfortunate and it kind of shows that if we actually had good money, then prices wouldn't just be you know stagnant you know like if we measure food in bitcoin terms prices aren't just you know going sideways prices are actually collapsing like your, your food is getting a lot cheaper if you're using bitcoin as money no matter what you know the federal reserve does or what the fiscal or what the federal government does so i think that's kind of like the key idea of the acceleration of production section is just kind of highlighting that these goods that we measured the dollar in or that we pegged the dollar to 
We're getting extremely productive at producing them. Yet the Federal Reserve has this mandate to make sure that the dollar gets, you know, more expensive uh, relative to, to, to these goods or these goods get more expensive relative to the dollar. And so it's kind of just siphoning wealth away from people that happen to hold dollars, which, you know, if you have a checking account or savings account, you might hold, you know, a portion of your portfolio in dollars themselves, or you might have government bonds that are basically promises for a fixed amount of future dollars. That's just the federal reserve is devaluing your wealth at a time when, you know, the wealth, the the purchasing power of your dollars, which should be going a lot further because we're getting a lot more productive at producing these things. Man, it's it's crazy because Jeff Booth says it too. He's like the the free market, it should be deflationary by design, right? Like our a free market should be deflationary. And you're right. And you're showing our ability to, you know, produce energy, which is crazy to think about how much easier and how much more energy we're able to produce. And at what a what a lower cost we're able to produce it for, but yet they're constantly selling it to us for more. So no matter how much mm -hmm. more you're making at work, it's never enough to offset the cost of everything going up around you. So no matter how, I mean, that's why people are working two jobs right now. I mean, every day I cover, I play shows on my LFA TV show about you know families and, and just the average day American. It's like they're debating between paying their paying their rent or feeding their kids or paying their taxes is a big one. People are like I literally cannot afford to pay my taxes pay my bills and, and keep a keep a keep a roof over my head and then make it even worse. Now we have our government who's coming in and they're printing money out of thin air. They're taxing you 53% of every penny you make and they're taking that money and they're outbidding your rental hop houses so that they can put migrants who broke into this country illegally into rental properties. So now the people can't afford their rent because rent's going up by 200% because mm -hmm. our government is literally stealing the wealth from you whether it's through inflation or through taxation. I mean, at some point it has to break. Do you think people are going to realize that, like that that's the big picture? Or do you think it, it gets so bad that people can't even afford to buy Bitcoin? No, I don't. I, I don't think the, the latter, or at least I, I certainly don't hope for the latter. I think two things are going to happen, really. It's more people that have significant amount of wealth will start using Bitcoin as an alternative. And I think that would be great. Kind of like you brought up earlier, where if you have a portfolio of 100 single family homes, let's say you learn about Bitcoin and you recognize that, hey, the future compound annual growth rate of Bitcoin will likely be better or higher than my 100 single family homes. Maybe I should sell at least a portion to start of my sing single family homes and buy Bitcoin. And again, I think that's kind of a win win for both the guy that has a lot of wealth and also for regular people that don't own a hundred homes that actually just pay rent and are trying to get by. And I think that that's going to be great because he's going to sell off a portion of his real estate portfolio, lowering the prices of real estate. And then he also gets to hold Bitcoin, which is the best form of money. And it doesn't have a leak. It's not melting away. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. So it's not melting away. And I think that's going to be great. And then two, I think the people that are regular people that, you know, want to save for the future, but also don't want to invest in, you know, the S&P 500 or government bonds and, and real estate to, you know, fund the big government or to fund big woke corporations or to buy real estate that effectively crowds the, themselves out of, of the, uh, the real estate market or raises their rent on themselves, kind of, uh, they can now just buy Bitcoin. They'll outperform investing in those entities. And I think that they'll just be better off uh, because of that. And so, yeah, I think I think over time, people are going to continue to figure out Bitcoin. Hopefully, you know, it happens faster rather than later. Uh, but, you know, it still could take a couple decades. Do you see the new um, capital gains tax that they're trying to pass? They just put out yesterday. I haven't seen that. What is it? 57% in California. So, wow. and, and he's planning to install a, a second death tax. And then he's trying to push through unrealized capital gains tax. Yeah. If we ever get unrealized capital gains tax, that would be. Can you explain great. that to our audience so for people that don't understand? Like how, how yeah. detrimental would that be to society in America? Yeah. So, I mean, right now, a lot of people are sitting on, you know, massive unrealized capital gains. In fact, this problem actually probably gets worse as the, the the money that we use today the us dollar uh -huh. kind of gets 
kind of collapses or inflation rises because mm -hmm. again like the dollar is designed to debase against these basic consumer goods if inflation rises even more than they intend it to rise then that means the value of relatively scarce goods like the s p 500 uh government bonds real estate that only goes up even more and so it kind of exacerbates the problem where if you're going to tax the unrealized gains on these assets at a time when you're printing more money than ever before and these assets aren't really going up because they're more valuable they're going up because the government's printing money it's kind of just like a roundabout way to extract more and more wealth from the population yeah. and it probably would just not end very well <laughs> i think it's it's kind of good that there's something like bitcoin because again it's property that you can move you know if if you have you know hundred if you have a million dollars worth of real estate in california you can't necessarily necessarily move your real estate from california to a different state or a different country Where, whereas bitcoin you, you you actually could do that you can just take your 12 words or your 24 words and you know actually go somewhere else if you really needed to if things got that bad i don't think things are going to get that bad because it would just be really really bad and i think over time again i think more and more people are going to adopt bitcoin i think things like AI and, and robotics and stuff like that are going to bring massive growth and make people's lives better that the government won't have to resort or won't have the power to even resort to doing things like this. Uh, but I think over time, you know, Bitcoin is going to be a, a solution and it kind of offers hope for people that might see these, you know, massive uh, increases in taxes as like something that's going to end the world or, or end America. It could if it happens, but uh I think Bitcoin is a better solution and I think people will figure it out over time. I think you're right. I think you're right on a lot of that. Where, what state are you in right now? Are you in I'm America? in Georgia. Yep. You're in Georgia. How are things down in Georgia as far as like the migrants, what's going on? I think you guys got MTG down there fighting for you, which is, she seems to be like a soldier for some, I mean, depending on what type period of time, but I think most people like MTG. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on with our government in Georgia and what they're doing with the invasion and migrants and crime and Antifa? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Uh, I definitely think we need to make sure that we have strong borders, right? Um, and I think George, like Brian Kemp, I'm I'm a fan of, of Brian Kemp, uh, who's the governor of Georgia. Uh, I think as long as we strive for, you know, empowering local communities, not empowering, you know, large federal government mm -hmm. and empowering the individual, uh, overall, I think that that's going to be like the best way to go about, uh, you know, making things safe, making, you know, keeping people like making your family safe, making your community safe. And so, yeah, overall, that's, that's probably kind of my thoughts there. And I think Bitcoin will, will help people, right? Like Bitcoin will enable you to save, will enable you if your area gets bad or your state gets bad, it enables you to move and bring your property elsewhere. Uh, if, if things aren't going the way that you expected it to, to go. So yeah, I think Bitcoin is another tool that can help people in the state of Georgia or in the state of California or in another country. And how are how are the politics down there as far as uh, about Bitcoin? Like I, have, I haven't really heard MTG or or Brian Kemp or any of these. What are their stances on Bitcoin? Have you heard? I I haven't heard like some of them specifically, but I know that Georgia is actually one of the largest states for Bitcoin mining. We ha we have like Clean Spark here, who's a public miner. We have Core Scientific either was here or still is here and then there's there's clean spark has at least two mines in the state of georgia i think the state of georgia is in the top five states of bitcoin of bitcoin miners of, of all the states in the us so yeah i mean i think georgia is relatively open to it they're not like texas or anything where there's a lot of uh aggressive like pro bitcoin uh you know actions in the state of georgia i'm tr I, I happen to tweet about it sometimes to brian kemp he hasn't replied to me yet but maybe he will <laughs> one day but uh yeah no i think like georgia just needs to focus and other states just need to focus on individual property rights and you know building more energy uh production facilities and building more bitcoin mines and i think that that's going to be good for these different states and walk us through this um you got another chart up here i wanted to get into Taking a look at the screen right here. Can you explain this to our to our audience? What we're what we're looking at here? Uh, what is the chart? I can't see it. Um, oh, on my here, end. give me give me one second. I probably got to change a change a button. You should be able to see it. How about now? Can you see it now? Oh yeah, yeah. It's a great yeah. great uh table. Yeah. So this is just comparing the different forms of money 
uh, with their monetary properties. Like, I think a lot of people think about Bitcoin and they see it as, oh, well, today it's not a medium of exchange. Today, it's not a unit of account. Like, you don't go to Publix and you don't see, you know, your, your grocery prices in Bitcoin. And it's super volatile, right? Like, so how can that be a good money? I think those are kind of looking at the end game of what money is rather than looking at objectively specific tools that can be used as money and looking at the properties of that money that ultimately lead to something being a good unit of account, meaning of exchange and store of value. And so I think when you objectively look at Bitcoin, crypto broadly, gold, dollars, and this can be expanded to you know salt, glass beads, other mm -hmm. historical shells, other historical forms of money, you can look at these objective properties and clearly see that Bitcoin is superior compared to all previous forms of money. Bitcoin is perfectly scarce. It's immutably perfectly scarce. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. It's fungible where each Bitcoin is interchangeable with another Bitcoin. Whereas like real estate, for example, is not fungible. Like your house is different from my house. It's Bitcoin is portable, meaning you can take it anywhere in the world. You can send it any, anywhere in the world within you know seconds or minutes uh, for relatively cheap. It's durable. Again, Bitcoin is only 12 words or 24 words. So it's just data. Uh, if as long as you know 12 words exist in the universe, then your Bitcoin is extremely durable. And then last, it's divisible, right? Like Bitcoin, each Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshis or Sats in each Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is highly divisible as well. And so I think that these properties are what makes a good tool a good form of money. And I think that that's you know exactly what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is objectively the best form of money because of its unique properties. What do you think is going to be the next catalyst for like wave of in, in, in adoption? We've seen like the ETFs come in. I, I think a lot of money is coming in. We're seeing ETFs go on a global scale. I know there are some that are popping up over in Hong Kong and these other countries now. Do you see another catalyst? Do you think it's going to be a nation state or a government mining Bitcoin? What do you think is going to be that next push that really propels us forward? I think now that we're about 24 hours away. Uh, I think the having is a, a big push in, in Bitcoin. I think it's, I think it is a supply side shock to Bitcoin because I think miners are the ones that are selling a lot of they're, they're basically the only forced consistent force seller in the Bitcoin network, right? Like most people that hold Bitcoin, if you look at some charts, like the hot waves, which I have right behind me, uh, you can see that most Bitcoin actually don't move. Like they sit there for years and they don't actually move. So the price of Bitcoin is set by the small marginal number of coins that are moving on like a daily basis, which is like 1% of the supply or, or even less. And so miners are an entities on the network that are mining Bitcoin and they're selling the Bitcoin that they mine to cover their expenses, right? So if you mine Bitcoin for you know, fifty thousand dollars. You can sell it now for sixty-three thousand um, dollars. When you miners actually, you know, the there's something called the difficulty adjustment in Bitcoin, where as the the price of Bitcoin goes up, more miners come online, and that makes mining Bitcoin more difficult. And so miners are typically at least selling the Bitcoin that they mine to cover their energy expenses, which means over time, mining Bitcoin is a very perfect and competitive market. And so most of the Bitcoin that gets mined ends up being sold. And so that's, again, like the only consistent seller of Bitcoin. Uh, and once the halving occurs and the block subsidy gets cut in half, now that's when what happens is the weakest miners on the network, the ones that have the highest energy costs or the least efficient machines, they you know get can't, can't continue operating because the revenue just cut in half, but their costs remain the same. So after the halving, the weakest miners get purged from the network and then there's less day-to-day -day sell pressure, you know, over time, which I think is, is going to be great for Bitcoin. So I think the halving is a big catalyst. And then I think again, number go up is kind of like the main catalyst for Bitcoin where people see it going up. They see, you know, it didn't die. They thought it died, but it didn't die. And it didn't die for like the fifth time that they thought it died. And so then they have to question their beliefs. They have to question their ego and they have to figure out like, Hey, Maybe I should actually spend 30 minutes watching a YouTube video on Bitcoin to figure out if something's actually here. 
And I think when people, when people do that and the price is going up, it kind of gets a bias in their head of like, okay, I'll buy, you know, a little bit this time. And then the price goes up more and they're like, okay, now I really need to dive into Bitcoin. So I think the having is a big catalyst. I think number go up, which is somewhat inevitable in a long enough time horizon. That's a big catalyst. And yeah, I think eventually like eventually like nation states and central banks, they have a money printer, you know, at their their side. And now we have this new form of money that's a that's an unprintable money. And it's like, what's the game theory when, you know, all of these different countries and central central banks all over the world, you know, can literally print money. What happens when they're like, OK, maybe we should start secretly using our printable money to buy the unprintable money. And, you know, at some point that, that that'll probably play out, who knows exactly when, but I think it's going to happen eventually. Man, that's going to be such a cool time. I wonder, I wonder if they're going to like how much Bitcoin they're going to be able to acquire before we realize they're doing it. Yeah. Who knows? I would imagine not that much because again, I think most Bitcoin sits there and, and doesn't move. And I think the reason is like, again, if you, if you have a significant amount of wealth and you're holding it in Bitcoin, there's nothing better to cash out into. That's like, I think a lot of people don't fully understand that where they're like, oh, Bitcoin is a, a bubble or a Ponzi scheme where it's like, Bitcoin is actually just money and it's money that is perfectly scarce and it's going up forever as long as you think humans are going to get more productive and producing, you know, basic day to day goods. And so you could sell Bitcoin, but what would you sell it for? Are you going to sell it for dollars, which they're going to print? No, that's not a good idea. You could sell it for real estate and maybe you do for, for some if you want a nice place to live. But again, we can build more houses and we can build more apartment buildings. So over the long and real estate decays, it has property tax you don't really want to store your wealth in Bitcoin. You can invest it in a company, but there's risks to doing that. And, and so it's like, once you have Bitcoin, you are, you've cashed out, you've, you're the one that's cashed out of dollars into Bitcoin. And so, yeah, I think if a government or central bank does decide to eventually print money and buy the unprintable money, they probably won't get too much and the price will probably uh, start going pretty high. <laughs> And it's going to be crazy because I got on the chart here. I was talking about it yesterday um, is the amount of Bitcoin left on exchanges. If we scroll down here, there's only 1.73 million. Now, this is not normal, right? Uh, yesterday, 5,000 some odd Bitcoin had left exchanges the day before, which was 9,310. Um, so I did the math on it yesterday. Yesterday, it was like 70,000 or 71,000 a month in the last 30 days. And it was like Five seven. So I just said, well, if nine thousand and three hundred eleven Bitcoin left exchanges every day, there would be zero Bitcoin left on exchanges in about one hundred and eighty one days. If seventy million a month left every thirty days, um, it would take us about twenty four months. But at some point, I feel like we we have to hit a supply shock, right? Where there's just so little Bitcoin on exchange, which I, which I think makes price discovery like uncharted territory. Like there's no real. How I I I've, I've asked everybody this. How do you know? Don't feel bad if you don't, because nobody's yeah. been able to tell me yet. How the hell is Bitcoin's price actually calculated? I know it's supply and demand, but when we get into a point where there's so few on exchanges, how how is that calculated? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, it's basically just where the marginal buyer meets the marginal seller. So it's it's the free market, supply and demand, like you said. Uh, and, and it's like, if there's a lot of people trying to buy Bitcoin all at once, then the price goes higher. And if there's a lot of people trying to sell Bitcoin all at once, then the price is going to go lower. And again, like there's natural sellers in the market, like there's miners, there's miners that are going to hit market sell, you know, every day for the next, you know, next hundred plus years, because they're have to, they have energy expenses to pay. So they're going to be the ones hitting marginal. They're going to be the ones hitting market market sell. And there's going to be people like me that are going to keep hitting market buy, no matter really what the price is. Um, because I'm just trying to save for the future. Like people market buy the you know stocks in their 401k, right? Like they're just they're just buying at the price, whatever the market price is. And so it's just yeah, it's just where marginal buyers meet marginal sellers, and that's where the price happens to be. Then there's like traders in the middle of like just using leverage and speculating that hey, I think Bitcoin's going to go down here, and they add more sell pressure, or they trade and think Bitcoin's going to go up here, and they add more buy pressure. So yeah, there's just lots of different players betting on where the price goes and a market just gets made. So there's a lot of people right now that are talking about this flash crash that might be coming in, in traditional markets. Um, there's a trade that uh, I don't know if you follow Joe Brown at Heresy Financial. He's one of my good buddies and he puts out a lot of good videos and he was showing us the same trade that's basically been setting up right now 
I don't know, however many years ago during the 08 financial crisis, this, this trade set up and it wiped out about $3 billion worth of traders and it almost fractured the system. And uh, right now that same trade setting up with like $163 billion worth of, uh, I guess, built up leverage inside the system. And if this thing starts to spiral out of control, do you think that if we had a flash crash, you would see people running to Bitcoin or do you think Bitcoin's still so correlated to, to, to traditional markets that it'll, it'll keep coming down with traditional markets? Yeah, so I think Bitcoin is effectively like a liquidity sponge where just like March 2020, if there was a flash crash in the S&P 500 or real estate or whatnot, Bitcoin would have the, you know, the underlying bid completely sucked out of it and it would crash uh, for sure. Uh, I think what would happen after that, just like March 2020, when price of Bitcoin fell from $9,000 to $3,000, the level of money printing that would be unleashed if, you know, the equity markets did actually start collapsing at a rapid rate or the real estate market started collapsing at a really rapid rate, the level of money printing that would occur would be absolutely massive. And Bitcoin would, again, just like post-March 2020, it would absolutely soar. So yeah, I think, you know, money is only worth something if the economy works and there are productive businesses producing products. If the market is collapsing and everyone's like fearing for their job and, you know, there's no companies out there producing anything, the money's kind of worthless. So if as long as like the economy somewhat functions, and I think they will always keep printing money to keep it functioning in the short term, then Bitcoin's going to continue going up every time they unleash that new wave of liquidity. What's your outlook on the, on the market, traditional markets over the next six to 12 months? Do you think we have a a recession in sight, or do you think they're going to print and uh, send us off? It's a good question. Uh, I like my perspective, and whenever I like try to ex express my personal opinion on on markets, I think that trying to time markets in the short to medium term, which could be you know over the next 12, 24 months, is pretty much impossible. Uh, so with that said, I you know I don't know uh, what I would personally what I personally do is I minimize leverage as much as possible. Uh, I hold really good assets like Bitcoin. And I recognize that, you know, over the next 12 to 24 months, there's going to be volatility. And, you know, you, as long as you don't have, you're not overexposed to too much leverage and you have high quality assets like Bitcoin, you're probably going to do pretty well, especially over the long run. But yeah, next 12 to 24 months, I would expect it, things to be, you know, really good. Uh, just in general, but you know, anything can happen. Like you said, if there's this, you know, lack of liquidity, the fed decides not to lower interest rates anytime this year, they, you know, the market starts falling and they're like, you know, you know what, like, I don't care. Like, we're just going to let it keep falling. Then yeah, the market will keep falling for sure. Uh, but at some point, just like March, 2020, just like 2008, they'll come in and they'll pump it all back up because if, you know, if you just let the system unfold, it, the the dollar is debt based money where everyone owes each other money even the banks like owe each other money like your dollar and your bank account is just someone else's mortgage so if you let the system just completely implode the banking system completely doesn't work and money can't flow and your dollars that you had in your bank account don't really function so like so like eventually the money printer has to come back on and the dollar has to get debased and so i don't know how fast that happens each time but that's the end game every single time um, so yeah, I think just hold Bitcoin and expect volatility. Do you think there comes a point where our government passes a, an executive order or a law that prevents you from converting us dollars into Bitcoin, or even tries to impose some type of restrictive limit on it, like 20,000 a year or whatever the case may be? It's a good question. I certainly wouldn't rule it out as, you know, a possibility, but I think it's probably fairly low. Like I, I think of Bitcoin as becoming a new form of savings. Like I think of the S and P 500 as savings. I think of, you know, government bonds as savings. I think of real estate as savings. It would kind of be like the government coming out and saying, you can't invest so much more in the S P 500 or you can't invest more in, in real estate. Like the government kind of wants people to be wealthier, right? Like that's what gets the economy going. Like that's what gets people spending. And so I think it's in, everyone's incentive to keep Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin going up. 
it means we're becoming more productive. It means we're becoming more wealthy. It means we have more purchasing power. And so I think that that's going to be good for the world. And I don't think that it's necessarily going to be bad for, you know, the government to, to come in and say like, Hey, you can't actually buy more Bitcoin. So I think everyone's going to get on team Bitcoin on team number go up. Uh, but you know, if things go bad and, 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 uh, the government tries to do stuff like that, then I think it's going to be like a, a, a game theory competition among governments where like other governments are not going to do that. Other, other governments are going to say, Hey, like, like El Salvador, we're a Bitcoin safe haven, you know, country where if you hold a lot of Bitcoin, come move here and we're not going to actually take your Bitcoin, um, or not going to prevent you from, from buying more. So I don't, I think it's possible for sure. I certainly hope it doesn't happen. Uh, and it would be a really bad for individual property rights if it does happen, but, uh, it's, it is possible. I, I think so too. That's what scares me the most. Joe, you're, you're putting out a lot of amazing work. I want to give you plenty of time. We're almost on that hour mark, but I want you to tell everybody where, where everybody can follow you. I got your Twitter up out here on the screen links down below in the show notes as well. Uh, tell us about unchained as well. And, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. Yeah. Appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's been awesome to be on the show, but yeah, you can follow me on Twitter or X. My handle is three capital I I I capital, uh, make sure to watch out for the impersonators. They're out <laughs> there. You can also check me out on YouTube at Joe Burnett 27 on YouTube, uh, post Bitcoin content, you know, almost every day. Uh, and then check out Unchained too, unchained.com. Uh, we brought up the report earlier in this episode, so definitely go check that out. That's at unchained.com slash melting, and you can download it there. Perfect, Joe, man. It was such an honor to have you on the show. Hopefully you'll come back and join us anytime, especially if you guys are working on anything, you got any more reports or any stories you want to put up, push out, you're always welcome to come and jump on an interview and uh, shoot the shit and talk about Bitcoin with us. Awesome, yeah. Loved it. It was fun to, to, to chat. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right, folks, that's a wrap. If you guys want to support us over here on Ryan Matta Show, you guys can check out our sponsors, MyPillow.com. You guys can use promo code Matta. It'll get you 65% off everything store-wide. We'll be over on LFA TV today at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Come join us. God bless you guys. Stack that Bitcoin. We'll catch you in the next one.